All right. So now this is the official welcome. Um, thank you all for participating in that. I downloaded the images, so we'll share that with, with all of you after the session today. Um, I do want to take care of one quick housekeeping technical thing. Um, Randy wasn't able, our one speaker wasn't able to get on the internet until uh, just a few minutes ago. So Randy, I've made you a presenter. If you don't mind just really quickly making sure you can advance the slides in the bottom left-hand corner there. Perfect. Great. Okay, thanks so much. So for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Laura Brandis and I'm the Communications Director at the Polis Water Sustainability Project, which is based at the University of Victoria Centre for Global Studies. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. And this is the third webinar in this year's Creating a Blue Dialogue webinar series. Uh, and this is actually the fifth year that we've been running this series. And one of the main goals with this project is to bring together in one virtual space um, people from a diversity of backgrounds and professions, water leaders, water thinkers, water professionals, to engage with innovative, new, emerging ideas in water um, policy and governance. Uh, we generally get participation from all across the country. Um, and I really like this community because it's a group that I don't think would ever come together in a you know, real live conference room. The technology actually enables us to have this really interesting group of people on the line. Now, as you know, today's session is going to focus on groundwater reform. Um, and we're excited to have a guest speaker here from California to tell us a bit about um, their experience there and, and draw out some lessons for other jurisdictions. As I'm sure many of you know, British Columbia recently passed its Water Sustainability Act. Um, and the groundwater piece of this legislation, um, those regulations are one of the elements that will bring this new act into force next year. So we're looking forward to hearing about the California experience developing their Sustainable Groundwater Management Act um, and what we can perhaps learn from that experience. Now, of course, before we get going, um, I need to uh, give a big thank you to our various partners and supporters. All of them are on this slide right here. Um, I do want to particularly acknowledge the Canadian Water Network, who is our main sponsor of this year's webinar series, and also Water Canada Magazine, um, who are our media sponsor. Um, Oh, sorry, I just am noticing in the chat box, unmute your speakers upper left. Can, I'm, I'm assuming you all can hear me. Okay, perfect. I just wanted to make sure that comment wasn't directed to me. Okay, now there's always a little bit of housekeeping things before we begin. Um, the first has to do with audio. As I'm sure you've all realized, I have a blanket mute on everybody in the room. We're expecting over 100 listeners today, um, so it would be utter chaos if I uh, had you all unmuted. Um, so it will just be me and the two presenters who you can hear. Um, so this, regarding the question period, the way that we'll deal with questions is via the, the chat box, which many of you are already using. Um, we'll let both of the presenters give their, their presentations, and then at the end, we'll um, open up the chat box. You guys can type your questions in there. I'll, I will moderate and read them out, and our two panelists will answer. Um, and finally, I think a lot of you have already been introducing yourselves, but this is also the time when I invite you to just let us know who you are, um, where you're from, if you have uh, multiple listeners on your end, um, how many people are in the room with you. Um, this is one of the ways that we can really get a sense of the community that we have created in the space here today. And when you, while you do that, um, I want to introduce today's speakers. Our first speaker is going to be Thomas Hart Harder, and he's a professor at the Department of Land, Air, and Water Resources at the University of California, Davis. His research focuses on non-point source pollution of groundwater, on groundwater resources evaluation under uncertainty, uh, on groundwater modeling, and on contaminant transport. So he will have a lot of uh, expertise and knowledge to share with us. And our second speaker is somebody that I've worked with on and off over the years. Uh, Randy Christensen is a lawyer with Ecojustice Canada with a focus on water law and policy. And he's also a research associate here at the Polis Water Sustainability Project. So on that note, I'm going to hand the reins over to Thomas 
Thomas, if you don't mind unmuting your line so that we can hear you. Good morning, Laura. Can you hear me? I can hear you. You're a little bit um, fuzzy. I don't know if there's anything we can do about that. I, it may be your phone. Uh, your phone. Yeah, let, me adjust, let me make some adjustments here. Is this better? Uh, yeah, that may be a little bit better. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you know if it, if it starts to fade or anything. Um, yeah, and, um, yeah, you can take it over from here. All right. Well, thank you, Laura. Thank you to Polis for having me here this morning. Um, I'm excited to talk about California and what we're doing. Water is on our mind. And where I'm going to start is with talking about the drought. And I imagine at least uh, a little bit of the news on the drought has traveled to California. It's a major driver for our water policy here in the state, as you can imagine. Um, and talk then in uh, starting with the drought, I want to take that as a transition to also explaining how water actually works in California and how groundwater fits into the water management equation. Talk about the consequences of drought and overpumping groundwater and use that as a background to talk about the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act that we passed last year. So the drought has certainly been on everybody's mind here. We're entering the fourth year of drought. Um, our reservoirs are well below normal at this point um, in much of the state except the northernmost part. So we're seeing lots of big bathtub rims at this time that we normally only see in the fall. Um, the loose last year was about many fallow fields and orchards actually dying. Uh, people running out, literally out of water on public water supply systems where wells were no longer deep enough to fetch groundwater and having people having to haul in water from distant sources or buying bottled water because there's simply no water in there. Well, the drought this winter has continued. We've had um, a couple rainy weekends, and that has been about it. And it's really grasping most of the West, although it is centered on California. Looking at this historically, we've always had droughts. Um, and certainly last year was not the record driest year. We've had drier years in the 1920s and in the late 1977. The late 1970s, 1977 was really among our driest years. But when we look at the triennial total precipitation throughout the last 100 years, this slide goes and starts at about 1900 and goes through 2013, 2014. The, um, the period that ended in September last year was, in fact, the lowest three-year total record in the last 115 years. Um, and the other thing that you can see on the slide is that we've had, well, we've had similarly dry periods in the late 1920s, um, again in 1976, 1977. The uh, frequency of these periods seems to be accelerating. Um, we had uh, uh, several dry periods in the 1920s, 1930s. We had um, one dry shot in 1950, one in 1960, and then really nothing until 1977. But since then, we've had a drought period in the late 80s. We've had a dry period, uh, late 80s through the early 90s. Um, uh, in the early 2000s, in the late 2000s, and now we're back to drought again. Of the last 14 years, really only three years have been um, at normal or above normal with respect to precipitation. It's that three-year record in the frequency of these droughts that really has a major impact on groundwater. Um, and needs to be kept in mind when we talk about managing groundwater resources. As I said, this winter is no, um, no exception in a four-year string of dry years. We're um, just uh, declaring the lowest snowpack this morning that has ever been measured on record. I flew um, across the state yesterday, and the snowpack on the Sierra was comparable to what we usually see in June um, or sometimes in July. So where do we sit with respect sort of the overall climate in California? As I said, drought is not something that is new to us. We are, in fact, a relatively dry state. 
we are a state where we have a fundamental disconnect, both in space and in time, between where water is falling from the sky and where water is used. Most of our rain occurs in the winter, and most of our water use is in the summer. Most of our rain falls in the mountains. Most of our water use is in the valleys. Most of the rain falls in the north, and most of the water use is in the center and in the south. In the south, we have precipitation that's often not in excess of 200 millimeters per year. Central California has precipitation that's on the order of 300 to 400 millimeters per year. Far northwestern California gets fairly wet at precipitation rates that are in excess of 1,200 millimeters per year. Um, the water users, the two main water users are uh, the urban nights in California shown in the lower left. The red areas show the major metropolitan areas of California. We have about 38 million people living in our state using about 10 cubic kilometers of water. On the upper right in brown on the California map, you can see the irrigated agricultural areas, the Central Valley being the largest area. Um, we also have irrigated agriculture in Southern California as well as in our coastal basins. In total, almost 10 million acres or 4 million hectares of irrigated agriculture with an annual water use that's on the order of about 35 to 45 cubic kilometers, four times as much as our urban areas. There are dedicated water supplies uh, for environmental flow that are also on the order of about uh, 55 cubic kilometers, matching the total of urban and agricultural water supplies uh, that we have prescribed into regulations. So in total, about 120, 110 cubic kilometers of dedicated water supplies out of about 250 cubic kilometers total precipitation annually. That's that's our picture, and how have we dealt with the spatial and temporal disconnect? We have built, we have the snowpack for one thing to help holding over water from the winter for the summer, and that's what's missing this year and what has been missing in the past two years. We've also built surface water reservoirs all around our mountain, the foothills of our mountain ranges. All of our valleys are surrounded by reservoirs that hold water running off in the spring and early summer for use later in the summer or in following years if it is a wet year. We've also built a large infrastructure of canals that, are connect that, are, that is connecting essentially most of California um, through, mostly through the Central Valley. Uh, the Sacramento River in the northern part of the Central Valley brings water from the north down to the delta. And let me try and see what I can operate the um, cursor here. So the, what we call the San Joaquin Sacramento uh, uh, River Delta is right here in the center of the um, state. Um, the Sacramento River comes out down from the north. The San Joaquin River drains the central part of the Central Valley and all goes out to the ocean right here. Um, this is our main train station, or my, my central station for water, so to speak, uh, from where all water that's going south is, is coming. And there are significant ecological issues associated with that. But that's not what I wanted to talk about today. What I wanted to talk about is the other part that's usually not as visible and not talked about that is a big part of this water infrastructure, and that is our groundwater basins. So what you see here is a geologic map of California, and in this, in this yellow color, I'm showing you those areas where we have un unconsolidated sedimentary deposits holding our large California aquifers. Um, in color, surrounding these oval-shaped areas of uh, uh, essentially delineating our central uh, sedimentary basins are the, the rock formations that make up the many mountains that we have in California. These rock formations and their fractures also hold groundwater, but at much, much smaller amounts than you would see in these areas that are designated yellow. I call them our bathtubs that are filled with sediments where the bathtub walls are these mountains. 
mountains and they continue underneath the sedimentary basin and the bathtubs are filled with sediment and the in these sediments is where we're holding most of our uh, groundwater. Hi, Thomas, now, I'm, yeah. I'm just going to interrupt for a minute. Your sound is getting a lot fuzzier. Um, I'm not sure if, if there's anything it, you can... I'm trying, I'm going to try to hold my microphone to, to a little bit closer. It's when I operate my mouse that I need to let go of my hand here. Um, okay. So these groundwater basins are a big part of our honor management, and let me sort of explain what I just, what I just uh, said with respect to this bathtub concept. So you have, in gray, you have our mountain ranges that are con con uh, continuing underneath these sedimentary basins. This is sort of a cartoon cross-section through any one of these yellow areas that you saw on the previous map. Um, these bathtubs are filled with sediments, and over time, with recharge from rivers that come out of the mountains with recharge from precipitation, uh, these sediments have always been filled with, uh, with groundwater, or with water. And what happens with that when, when these sediments are essentially full of water? Well, just like um, in your flower pot where when you keep watering the uh, dirt in your flower pot, the uh, water will start showing up at the lowest level in your uh, watering pot, this water will eventually show up at the lowest point in these uh, basins. And that's typically the rivers that are draining these basins. So groundwater really feeds actually these rivers under natural conditions in balance to the groundwater recharge that happens near the mountain front and from rainfall. Then in the early 20th century, we invented a turbine pump, which allowed us to pump significant amounts of water out of the subsurface, mostly during the summer. And then during winter, these water tables typically recovered uh, with that recharge that occurs from streams and rainfall. So it's a scenario that basically is a temporary uh, storage of winter rain for the summer. And we can see that when we look at the landscape water budget. So what you see here is a bar graph of monthly uh, water flows. What's below zero is coming out of the landscape, and what's above zero is going onto the landscape. This is an example from the southern part of the Central Valley. In light blue, you can see precipitation uh, for, uh, months, for the various months. And this chart goes from October through September, which is the um, water year. In light blue, you have precipitation. In middle blue, you have river water and that is being used for irrigation put on the landscape. And in dark blue, you have groundwater that is being used for irrigation. And as you can see on this graph, in the winter, it's the rainfall that contributes to the water budget of the landscape. In the summer, it's irrigation water from river and groundwater. Um, that water goes primarily to plants in red, uh, but also to recharge to groundwater in orange and yellow. Um, most, of the, most of the rainfall occurs in the winter, and most of the recharge is in the winter and spring months, but also in the summer months from irrigation return water. Most of the extraction from that reservoir from the groundwater is during the summer months. In a wet year, um, there is somewhat less extra extraction, especially during the spring months, because farmers can rely on rainfall and significantly more uh, groundwater recharge during the spring and summer months. While in dry years, we have practically no recharge, little rain, and much of the irrigation throughout the year comes from groundwater in this particular region. So not only are we storing water from winter for summer irrigation, but we're also storing water in these groundwater basins from wet years for use during dry years. This is ample um, evident in our state water budget. On the right side is the water supply. On the left side is the water use. In green, in light green, is the um, crop water use. In dark green to the right or gray to the right of the light green is the urban water use. And on the right side in purple, you see the, uh, the extraction from groundwater. In wet years, there is about 12 to 15 million acre feet, or um, about 16 to 20 cubic kilometers of groundwater extraction. In dry years, that can easily it can easily reach almost 30 cubic kilometers. So significant increase in groundwater pumping during dry years 
when compared to wet years. Groundwater is definitely a big reservoir, but it's also a place to move water. This is an area, again, in the southern central valley um, with a lot of water districts, each of which has a different type of water right. Some of these have very strong surface water rights and access to a lot of surface water, leading to significant amounts of recharge from irrigation. And in this area, this is uh, mostly in the northern part of that, in this area and in the south central part of this area where we see a lot of that recharge because of strong surface water rights. In the center, you see an irrigation district that has no surface water right and relies heavily on groundwater pumping. That district gets all of its groundwater essentially from its neighbors. What you see in the lower left in the bar chart are on the positive side over a 30-year period, the groundwater flows into that district, into the aquifer system of that district, which amounts to about 70,000 acre feet or about 80,000. Uh, eight, 80 million cubic meters of water that is essentially being fed in the subs through the subsurface towards these districts and the pumps in that district. Um, in the Central Valley as a whole, we see significant fluxes between uh, groundwater subbasins on the order of uh, 0.1 uh, um, or several tenths, uh, uh, one tenth of cubic kilometers between neighboring groundwater subbasins. So groundwater works both as a storage reservoir and as a, um, as a pipeline, so to speak. Um, the trouble that we get into is when we have these droughts, um, when water actually goes down much further than during average years. And what we're seeing in these drought periods um, is, if you look at this chart, I'm charting out the 1977 drought, the 1990, early 1990s drought, and the early 2000s drought. We typically see water levels go down 15 feet per year for extended periods of time, about five meters, three to five meters per year in this particular case. In other cases, it can be as much as 15, 10 to 15 meters per year. And when you have a four-year drought as we're in right now, that means over that period, we're lowering water levels by as much as 50 meters. And that has significant impacts, uh, other impacts that I'll talk about shortly. This is another example from the south part of the state near the coast where I was yesterday in Irvine, uh, Orange County, south of Los Angeles. They are also, uh, during these drought periods, both historically and current, we're typically seeing anywhere from several to uh, 10 meters of drawdown per, per year. With the accelerated frequency of droughts, it comes as no surprise that we're seeing most water levels in groundwater lower than they have been in this century or in the last, cent in the last century. Uh, this map shows wells in red that have more than 30 meters, uh, more than uh, uh, 15 meters lower water levels uh, in the last three, four years when compared to their lowest level in the 20th century. And you can see, especially in the southern part of the Central Valley, um, there are a lot of red dots. But throughout the state, you see areas that have at least um, below, um, that, that also record low water levels. In the Central Valley, the total depletion is over the last 100 years mostly from the southern part of the Central Valley is estimated to be on the order of 150 cubic kilometers, about three times, three times the annual supply of water from uh, 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 urban and agricultural areas. So there are significant consequences to this uh, groundwater overdraft. And Unlike what has been suggested in a newspaper article um, last week where um, a colleague of mine from Southern California working with NASA suggested we're running out of water in a year, we do have lots of groundwater, um, but just because we have a lot of groundwater doesn't mean we're not in crisis mode. Um, for once, we have increased pumping costs. Um, colleagues of mine in the economy department estimated that last year, the total impact of the drought to agriculture alone was on the order of $2.2 billion. But off that, the cost for drilling new wells and pumping water from larger depths than we've ever pumped it before amounted to about $400 million alone. 
Um, we have significant issues with land subsidence. This is a map of the land subsidence risk in California. These sedimentary basins often contain significant amount of clays that when water that when water levels are lower, start being essentially squished together. And as a result, we see land subsidence at the surface. On the lower left is a famous picture um, uh, by Poland, who did research in the middle of the 20th century on subsidence in the Central Valley, showing where land was in 1925, the sign you see at the top of the totem of the telephone pole here, and, land, and where the land then was 50 years later, where this fellow is standing on the road. We are seeing a significant reinitiation of that land subsidence. On the right is a map of the southern part of the Central Valley. Areas that you see there in yellow and red have seen land subsidence last year alone on the order of uh, 15 to 30 centimeters. Um, that's a significant amount of land subsidence for these large, vast, uh, uh, um, very, very flat areas with major consequences to especially the water canal infrastructure, but also to other infrastructure. Um, we see significant increases in seawater intrusion along the coast, at least those in those groundwater basins that are not managed against seawater intrusion. Of course, there are significant impacts to uh, seeps and springs and groundwater dependent ecosystems throughout the state not only from pumping, but just from having less um, recharge into uh, groundwater systems um, that are, uh, even groundwater systems that are not being used. Major impact is to streams. As we're lowering water cable, uh, the connection to streams is being lost. Uh, streams are losing water rather than gaining water, and in many cases actually have gone dry. We've seen this in, in the 20th century, and we're looking at an accelerated pace of that uh, moving forward. So given this as background, how are we dealing and how have we dealt with conflicts that we've always had around water resources, and especially during droughts here in California? So let me quickly review sort of the groundwater rights situation in California. California, until last year, had no statutory law governing the distribution of groundwater and very much relied on common law and the courts in resolving conflicts between groundwater users when they arose. For over a century now, the courts have established a solid system of what's called the correlative rights doctrine, which is fairly unique to California, and which essentially says that overlying landowners in a groundwater basin has a correlative right to the renewable supply of groundwater available in that groundwater basin. It's essentially a right that's correlative to the size of the land that people own and also to the properties of the aquifer. So it's essentially a sharing system of the renewable supply of groundwater. It's not a system that allows people to actually empty out groundwater basins. We have a constitutional mandate for beneficial use. Uh, water has to be shown to go to beneficial uses if it's being pumped out. We have many special districts uh, created by the le legislature that deal with water management, including groundwater management. There are a few districts in Southern California that have been created um, before last year, well before last year, throughout the 20th century, dealing with groundwater overtraps and groundwater replenishment. Counties, under their police power, have the right to stop the exploitation of groundwater out of the county. And we just saw a, um, one of the central California counties yesterday moving um, to prohibit exports of groundwater out of their county as a result of the drought. We've always had the courts that, that, that making decisions where conflicts arose. And the conflict in the 20th century mostly arose in Southern California. It has the smaller bathtubs, so to speak. It has the smaller groundwater basins. And so when groundwater development started on a large scale in the early 20th century, many of these basins very quickly saw overdraft and um, depletion to a degree where people were worked enough about it to go to court. And courts would um, perform what is called the adjudication process, um, basically under the principles of the correlative rights doctrine, bring all the landowners, all the larger landowners in the groundwater basin into the room and negotiate a, um, a what's called physical solution that divides up the available groundwater, renewable groundwater, among the various landowners 
in a in a basin. With the drought, uh, with the uh, droughts in the last 40 years, we've also seen significant statutory advances in the groundwater management arena. The 1990s drought has brought a first act. Um, so-called AB 3030 in 1992, which suggested groundwater management at the local level. It did not mandate groundwater management. At the end of the 2002 drought, we saw a piece of legislation referred to as SB 1938, which went a step further and said that where the state said, if you want money from the state for your water projects, you better have a groundwater management plan in place. And it also made some some work and put some requirements down for what actually had to be in that groundwater management plan. And finally, last year we passed the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which is the first comprehensive statutory law that California has addressing groundwater management. And as a matter of policy, it sets out that groundwater resources be managed sustainably for long-term reliability and multiple economic, social, and environmental benefits. The other important piece that it states is that groundwater management is best achieved locally. The state actually takes a step back in this game and it plays a role of carrots and sticks. And that role has been divided between two agencies. The Department of Water Resources, which has been primarily a planning department for the state, a water resources planning department, has a key role um, on the carrot side. It provides technical assistance. It is, it is the agency that's most likely to dole out some of the funding uh, that will be available to do groundwater management. It does, um, the act does require DWR to set minimum guidelines uh, and regulations on the delineation of groundwater basins and on what actually has to be in groundwater sustainability plans, which are mandated under this law, and I'll mention those later. Um, the Department of Water Resources will also be reviewing and approving groundwater sustainability plans and review their implementation on a uh, regular basis. The role of the uh, handling out the stick has been handed to the State Water Resources Control Board which is the um, state agency that has traditionally dealt with both water rights and also with regulation of uh, water quality. The State Water Resources Control Board has um, been given enforcement rights when local control fails. And the first step for them will come when the first deadline under this law, which is 2017, uh, is reached in 2017 uh, we have to have groundwater, the groundwater basins that are going to be required to do groundwater sustainability plans will have to have groundwater sustainability agencies. Um, and I'll talk about that again in a, in a minute here. The State Water Resources Control Board steps in when these deadlines aren't met, and it will have the power to control extraction, to um, tax the groundwater basin, and to develop, um, as a state matter, a groundwater sustainability plan. So. The first step, though, that is foreseen by the law is that these groundwater sustainability agencies will be formed over the next two and a half years. The Department of Water Resources identif identified these areas in yellow and orange as high and medium priority basins for groundwater management. And all these high and medium, ground uh, medium groundwater basins will have to have groundwater sustainability agencies covering them in whole. Um, to manage groundwater in these basins. Now, we do have these groundwater management plans from SB 1938 and AB, uh, and AB 3030 that have been developed in the past. And these groundwater sustainability agencies will largely be able to use these groundwater management plans at least as a starting point. Uh, the existing groundwater management plans already provide to a better or to, to sometimes to a minimal degree, sometimes to an extensive degree, context and basin descriptions. Um, there have been varying amounts of public and agency involvement in developing these existing groundwater management plans. They do have to set basin management objectives. And there is some monitoring that can be part of these groundwater management, existing groundwater management plans, but a very limited amount of accountability and review. 
that is fundamentally changing with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which provides the groundwater sustainability agencies with explicit powers for enforcement, for um, um, managing demand, and for um, raising taxes to do the business that they are uh, that that they need to do. The Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, unlike past groundwater management plans, also explicitly integrates groundwater management to some degree with surface water management. It explicitly states that groundwater management cannot deplete surface waters, uh, which is a, a, a novelty in the California uh, water policy landscape. It explicitly um, uh, integrates groundwater quantity management with groundwater quality management and it suggests a significant linkage between water management and land use planning. So the um, second step will be that these groundwater sustainability agencies develop a groundwater sustainability plan by 2022 or within five years of the, uh, what, it, what we call what I call GSA, uh, GSA formation. Uh, these plans Thomas? Yeah. I'm just wondering if you could maybe adjust your mic again. It's starting to get a bit fuzzy, and I also okay. want to give you a, a time warning. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks. So these groundwater sustainability plans will essentially do four things. They will outline a data collection, monitoring, modeling, and assessment program. They will outline the management of the supplies of uh, groundwater, basically of groundwater recharge as well as managing the demand on the groundwater system. And a very important part of these groundwater sustainability plans is the engagement of stakeholders in these groundwater basins and the management of these stakeholders. There are several areas for um, innovative thinking and, and improvements in this groundwater management. The governance structures um, are essentially a new item um, in the governance structure of California. These local groundwater sustainability agencies can take many different forms. Um, public agencies are all eligible to be a groundwater sustainability agency. Um, they can cooperate with other agencies under a memorandum of understanding or a joint powers agreement or other kinds of contractual agreements to form a single groundwater sustainability agency uh, consisting of multiple uh, public agencies. It can be a groundwater sustainability agency. One public agency may actually be the groundwater sustainability agency for multiple basins. So there's a wide range of uh, possibilities that are foreseen and we are only at the beginning of the learning curve. Stakeholder involvement will be very important. Again, there is going to be significant amounts of work uh, to be done by facilitators, um, I think um, uh, by folks that really are in the community business. And then dealing with data collection, data information systems, and data distribution will be another important part where um, significant advancements have yet to be made. Um, limiting groundwater use will be a significant part in basins that have overdraft. Building new infrastructure will be the main focus uh, financially, uh, um, improving and increasing recharge to these groundwater basins. There are a number of successful examples, primarily in Southern California, on how to manage groundwater and how to recover from significant overdraft. This is an example from the Water Replenishment District in Los Angeles County, which had significant overdrafts in the middle of last century and through a combination of water supply increases to the groundwater basins and demand management has been able to recover their groundwater levels. Similarly, Orange County Water District has built a very broad portfolio of groundwater supplies consisting of both local groundwater, local recharge basins capturing significant uh, amounts of uh, stormwater runoff from both streams and recharge basins, adding in water imports from Northern California, and now also having a uh, groundwater replenishment system that actually recycles the um, urban areas wastewater um, for groundwater recharge. Uh, Santa Clara Valley, Silicon Valley has had similar issues, also fighting with land subsidence near the ocean. 
um, and has recovered substantially by, a, by, by using a broad portfolio of local water projects, imported water projects, and capturing stormwater recharge as well as recycling water. We've built large groundwater banks uh, both in the Central Valley and in Southern California that actually have uh, significant storage on the order of three to four cubic kilometers of storage, mostly operated through recharge basins. One of the things that we are starting to see also is to manage groundwater recharge in winter and spring months to support summer stream flows, especially in Northern California where we have significant amount of salmon habitat that is, that is protected. The Groundwater Sustainability Act foresees that these plants are handled in ways that essentially a, a sustainable level is reached by 2040. And as you've seen on the previous slides, the existing examples of uh, groundwater management in Southern California, it does take decades to get to the place where, in fact, these basins are uh, demonstrably uh, sustainable. And having climate change and potentially an increased frequency in droughts throws in an unknown wrench in terms of how to deal with this in groundwater management, and we're only at the beginning of that decision process here this year. With that, I'm at the end of my presentation. Here are some resources that I can point you to, and I'll hand the microphone back. Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, Randy, if you uh, want to unmute your line, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you perfectly. Um, so you can you can take it from here. Um, I do have a resource pod. I don't have all of Thomas's links um, in the resource pod that I'll bring up at the end, um, but I'll, I'll check with the speakers and we um, hopefully we'll be able to share these slides with you so that you can have access to all of all of those resources as well. Okay, take it away, Randy. And Thomas, if you want to mute your line now, um, we can just all come on at the end for the discussion. Uh, great. Thanks, uh, Laura. And I, I want to say thanks to uh, Dr. Harder for um, joining the, the Polis webinar and giving us uh, the firsthand uh, insights into what's going on in California. It's, it's a, a very interesting, you know, if troubling situation. It's, it's, not, um, it's very uh, useful to hear, you know, from the front lines. And thanks to everybody who's uh, joining us on the webinar and uh, and the people who are continue continue to work on the uh, BC Water Sustainability Act, which is a priority for um, for Polis and for uh, EcoJustice. Uh, I just will say that for those of you who don't know EcoJustice, we're a nonprofit charitable organization. We focus primarily on litigation, uh, but we keep a few uh, keep active in uh, policy work on a few key priorities, uh, mainly species at risk work and uh, water, which is, uh, which is why we're involved in, um, in, in, this, uh, in this project. Um, and I just before I start, I I'll, uh, just want to apologize. It's somewhere in the transfer of the slides over to the webinar program, some of the formatting is a little off. So uh, as you'll see from the front cover, the, the text is going over some of the graphics. You'll see that on a couple of slides, but I think, I think they'll be readable for the most part. Um, Laura mentioned at the, at the beginning of the outset that, that BC has passed its Water Sustainability Act. And what that means is that the act, it's, a, it's an attempt to upgrade a centuries old, century old piece of legislation and, and bring it into um, modern times and, and, and try to accommodate some um, of, of our modern uh, concerns and priorities that weren't part of uh, crafting the legislation a century ago. Um, and it's, the update is going to focus on um, a large number of issues, uh, but for, for the purposes of today, I'm going to be uh, speaking mainly about the groundwater uh, initiative under the Water Sustainability Act and some of the planning mechanisms. Um, for several years now, both Polis and EcoJustice have been uh, working on looking at other jurisdictions and coming up with uh, analyses and recommendations for what we can do under the BC Water Sustainability Act. And I've, I've got a 
screenshot of a previous paper that we've done. Um, and we're going to be, it's on uh, the Public Trust in the Modern BC Water Act. Um, in the next month or two, we're going to be uh, putting out another uh, brief that's going to specifically compare what's going on in California and the, the steps that they've taken with things that we might do in British Columbia. Um, so before I get too much into the recommendations that might come out of that, uh, some people might be wondering is California and BC are quite, quite different. Can, can BC really learn from California? And some of those differences would include uh, we're really, you know, in some ways we're talking about a rainforest versus a desert. Uh, I just threw up some comparisons of water uh, precipitation for the largest cities in, in uh, BC and California, uh, respectively, Vancouver and Los Angeles, just to give you a, a sense of, of the differences. Um, and so in, in Vancouver, you're looking at 159 centimeters per year of rain, but if you if you go closer to where the water supply reservoirs are, uh, using the, the readings at Grouse Mountain Base, you're, you're getting close to 247 centimeters a year. Comparing that to Los Angeles, uh, which is getting 38 centimeters per year, and and you, if you know, if you're familiar with the Los Angeles experience, it's it's uh, required them to look uh, for long distance uh, solutions for their water. Um, second. Um, California just has a lot more people using, uh, making, making claims on the, on the water that they have. So that's a big difference. Um, and finally, BC is just, uh, it's, a, it's a bigger place. California, relatively speaking, is a large U.S. state, but it's not in the order of uh, magnitude of BC. Um, and the reason that's important is when you look at California, um, they have tapped out, for the most part, any potential new water sources. Um, that's not the case with BC. Certainly there are a host of environmental First Nations and other considerations that would go into uh, bringing online new water sources, but, but potentially those would be there. So just looking at, you know, summarize the major difference, BC has 11% of the population of California but over twice the land and a whole, whole lot more water. Um, so the, the upcoming brief will be with the, in the recommendations we make will be with the full knowledge that you can't take California's experience and apply it to BC directly. Uh, and we don't, we don't attempt to do that. But, it, but I think, uh, as I'll get into now, I think you'll find that um, there's actually a, a number of surprising similarities between what BC is trying to do under the Water Sustainability Act and what California is having to do. Um, so first in uh, thing that I would point out is that prior to uh, the Water Sustainability Act, water use in BC was largely unregulated. There were some requirements for uh, notification and registering your well, but there was no approval of the well itself. There were no limitations on uh, how much you could pump or where you could drill your well for the most part. Um, and in California, that, that was generally true as well. That's somewhat of a simplistic statement because it doesn't apply in basins that have been adjudicated. And there's always, you know, the possibility, you know, as Dr. Harder mentioned, that there's, there could be um, court intervention or, um, at, you know, actions from neighbors uh, complaining about your water use, but you weren't, you're not getting uh, approval for your water use or to drill a well at the outset. Um, both, second, both BC and California are trying to create modern water legislation. Um, both of them, at least nominally, put sustainability in the, in the names you know, of the act. It's at the core of what, what they're trying to achieve. Uh, both are systems where the major uh, Jurisdiction and governance of water is at the provincial or state level, uh, but they're within a federal system, and there, there's going to be federal legislation that could have an impact. And two, two examples of that would be in Canada, the, the Federal Species at Risk Act, and in the U.S., the Endangered Species Act, which could uh, impact uh, what is be otherwise being governed at the provincial or state level. Uh, 
third, or third both in both uh, jurisdictions are operating under a first-in-time, first-in-right system of water rights, uh, for surface water at least. Um, and if, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with that term, that means that uh, water rights are given priority in terms of their historical precedence and uh, how that works is that the oldest water license is going to have the highest priority the person who holds that is going to be entitled to their full out water allocation before the second most senior water user gets their rights. So they're both they're both uh, quite s similar in their their general approach to water rights uh, prioritization. Um, another interesting comparison uh, between what California is doing and what BC is doing is the is the attempt to create local decision making. Uh, as part of the water management process. As, as uh, Dr. Harder explained that um, under the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, um, local agencies are going to be front and center, and it's only in cases where uh, the local agencies don't hit uh, specific requirements that the state is going to step in. Um, in BC, it's, that's not the, the overall model, but um, there are plans for, uh, there are provisions for creating water sustainability plans in areas where there's chronic and um, long, long standing water conflict or scarcity issues. And uh, those will bring together local people to uh, develop the, the options and solutions uh, that would, would then be adopted longer term. Uh, and, and finally, I would just say that. California and BC have the same uh, sort of seasonal participation patterns. You're getting your precipitation in the winter. Your heaviest uses are in um, summer and early fall. Um, and they're both uh, jurisdictions where in, in an average year, the majority of the uh, water use is going to be surface water. Uh, but there's a a heavy dependence upon groundwater use as well, so it's a it's a very important part of the water supply. Um, and in BC, that runs on on average about 29 percent of uh, provincial water use is groundwater. In California, I've I've ran I've run across a lot of different statistics, but um, it, they they vary from 30 percent to 40 percent. But in in times of drought, you're seeing significant spikes in groundwater use. Uh, So just to, just to summarize why BC, why I would say that BC should be looking closely at California is that um, there are similar challenges in creating groundwater regulation you know, from the ground up. There's similar legal systems for surface water rights, similar goals to create modern water legislation, uh, multiple, serving multiple priorities uh, in groups and trying to achieve sustainability. Um, and, and what makes the California example uh, you know, quite quite opportune to look at at this time is they've just finished um, effectively the process that BC is now just starting in terms of trying to create legislation. Um, BC under the Water Sustainability Act is going to enact its regulations under a, a phase one, phase two system. Um, most of the groundwater work is, is uh, regulation is being developed right now under phase one. Uh, some of the planning will come in under phase two. Um, so this is a graphic that I obtained from the website of the governor's office in California. I don't propose to go to it in, de in detail, but it's a good visual representation of the complexity of um, how how this kind of groundwater planning uh, how complex it actually is um, and it, it's a little bit hard to read but if you look in the middle there's a timeline and it's looking at from the passage of the the groundwater or the sustainable groundwater management act um, to the development of plans at the at the right end of the continuum which is a, effectively 10 years so you can see the number of steps that that are there but then you you can also see that um, that that right end of the continuum is just the start of the plans coming into effect, and they're going to be there, there's going to be a 20-year period for actually achieving 
the sustainability criteria. So you're looking at, um, in this case, you know, from, from a jurisdiction that's dealing with uh, severe drought pressure, um, a plan to deal with it that's going, that's going to take you know, upwards of 30 years um, to really come into force. And the 30 years doesn't fully capture uh, how long this has actually taken because some of the original planning work began in the early 1990s. And so I've set out a, uh, some key dates there. Um, and so in the early 1990s, local agencies were allowed to develop groundwater management plans. And then, you know, by 2002, um, the, the state was, uh, you know, applying what might be, you call a carrot or a stick, but to be eligible for certain uh, streams of funding, you would have to have your groundwater managed plan in place. And then recently, um, there has been the sustainable, 2014, there's been the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Uh, 10 years to create the local agencies, go through a number of other steps uh, to get your plans in place, and then 20 years for the plans to become uh, effective. So this uh, would, uh, this is it's somewhat of a cause con for concern for, for uh, some commentators in California. And I would actually, in this slide, I've, I've uh, put an excerpt from an op-ed that was recently in the Los Angeles Times. Um, and I would just actually start with the title, uh, California has about one year of water left, will you ration now? Um, and uh, I, would, I would just focus, it goes through, in the first part of the excerpt, it goes through the timelines and how long this is going to take. And uh, then the part that I have bolded is, at, at that pace, it will be nearly 30 years before we even know what is working. By then, there may, may be no groundwater left to sustain. So a, if drawing, drawing a lesson for BC, look, you can look to California and you can, you can say that if you want to um, go down a, you know, the path of bringing you know, local users and local agencies in to plan your water and you want, you want um, to create a process where there's, people are going, going to be able to have a say and there's, there's political buy-in on what you achieve, that's going to take quite a bit of time. And so just comparing that to where BC is right now, um, BC right now is really where California was in the early 1990s. Um, we're going to have uh, probably uh, sometime in 2015 or 2016, we're not sure, uh, BC, the regulations are going to come in um, that will allow the, the, what, the creation of the water sustainability plans in BC. Um, currently, right now, there's no um, formal and you know, monetary incentives to encourage the local planning, and there's no timelines for identifying you know, aquifers at risk or phasing in requirements for mandated planning. So we're BC is very much at the front end of, of this process. Um, so that, that would be, the, I guess, what I would draw as the first important lesson from this, is that um, while BC may not face anywhere near the severity of, of the, the crisis that California is, is uh, facing, um, there are areas of water scarcity, and it, we need to be moving uh, sooner rather than later to start addressing that. Um, the lesson, second lesson that I would, I would say that you can draw from the California experience is that the, the provision for voluntary planning and the provision of, of fiscal incentives uh, ultimately, ultimately wasn't enough. Um, it certainly, it certainly uh, helped in um, the, the, the starting of planning at, um, at the local level, and uh, many agencies in California already have plans in place, in fact, almost all of them, but they're not plans sufficient to deal with the drought circumstances that they're facing right now. And then 
finally, I would say that um, another lesson that you can, you can draw from the California ex experience is that you need to define sustainability. And I would just note that when uh, the earliest groundwater management plans that were coming out of California could vary from two pages to hundreds of pages. So without, without some clear guidelines about what was required, um, uh, the, the utility of the plans that were being created uh, varied widely. Um, in, in 2002, California moved to a system where the groundwater plans had to address specific criteria but still at that point, it wasn't, uh, the plans themselves didn't have to be binding. They didn't have to achieve certain goals. And so you're, you're finding that a little over 10 years later, California then has to move to a system where you're specifically uh, defining and requiring what you want your water management uh, legislation to achieve. So what you're seeing under the California Sustainable Groundwater Management Act is uh, a list of things that must, uh, that must be achieved by groundwater management plans. And so um, these aren't things that merely have to be considered or things that must appear somewhere in the plan. At the end of the day, the, the plans have to ensure that these things uh, don't happen or, or that these criteria are met. So you're, you're looking at, at you know, binding requirements to ensure that there's not um, overdraft on, uh, on a long-term basis, that you're not pumping groundwater in a way that you reduce uh, groundwater storage, that you're preventing you know, significant seawater intrusion, you're preventing you know, the degradation of water quality um, and land subsidence and impacts on other users. So um, those are things that, you know, if you look at the Water Sustainability Act right now, those kinds of requirements are not part of of the legislative package. So um, just before we get to the discussion uh, portion, um, I would just like to, to again, you know, say that we're, we're in the middle of developing a specific set of, of recommendations and policy options, and that's going to be coming in the next month. And it will have a lot more detail uh, than I, what I went into today. Um, but just to, to recap, uh, what we think are the, the primary key lessons you need to draw from California is that the planning uh, to bring in local actors is going to take time. And um, BC can't simply take the approach from another jurisdiction about how it's going to do its planning. It's going to have to take the time to, to run the pilot projects in different watersheds and try a few different approaches and see what works in this context before you can even think about expanding planning to other um, at-risk basins. So um, while, the, while the Water Sustainability Act uh, creates the possibility of uh, water sustainability and management plans, it, it needs to ensure that, that um, there's, there's activity on the ground on that front. Um, and the other thing I would say, because of the length of time to develop this type of planning that, that as might be contemplated under a water sustainability plan, you need other tools um, to, to address water scarcity and, and drought considerations on a, on a short-term basis. And those of you familiar with the Water Sustainability Act might, might know of the temporary protection orders uh, that would allow um, you know, the, the intervention in, in water use and extraction uh, on a short-term basis in, in, in response to some extraordinary circumstances. And that's certainly a good start, but that needs, you know, those regulations need to, to come into place and there needs to be the, you know, the political uh, will to use those tools and not just have them, you know, on the, on the books. Um, the, the second lesson uh, would be about the, the voluntary uh, or you know, financial encouragement probably at the end of the day not going to be enough to uh, address problems in, uh, in, in areas where there's ongoing conflict and uh, chronic uh, issues with, with water. And so there needs to be, um, there needs to be a, you know, at least an option or the idea for the path forward that 
where it's needed that there would be some uh, binding requirements for planning and there, there, there would be some kind of you know, backstop so that the province could step in if, if uh, targets aren't uh, achieved at the local level. And then finally I would say that um, you know, drawing from California, uh, there needs to be a recognition in the development of the clear criteria of what, what happens with water management under, under the Water Sustainability Act. So identifying you know, the benchmark standards that, that water management has to meet, whether that be um, you know, preventing groundwater uh, depletion or um, you know, ensuring that in, you know, there's not interference with environmental flows or any number of things that need to be de developed at, at, uh, that are appropriate for BC. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank everybody for, for uh, you know, joining us, and I think we're, we're at the discussion part of the webinar. Great. Thank you so much, Randy. Um, Thomas, if you want to bring your voice back on as well, we'll uh, dive into the discussion portion. By my clock, we have about 19 minutes to, uh, to have some discussion. I, um, I'm just going to bring up the uh, resources pod that I had mentioned to you folks earlier. So this is by no means exhaustive, um, but this is a, a start to some links. And there's also a couple links um, that, that both Susie and Thomas have provided in the, uh, in the chat box today. Um, so this is, if you click on these, it'll take you to the website. So I'd encourage you to do that. Um, and in the briefing note that Randy has mentioned that we're working on getting out in the next month or so, um, there'll be a list of resources in there as well. So I know there were a few questions. There was a lot of dialogue happening throughout the webinar, and I, I wasn't able to grab all of the relevant questions. And I think a lot of them actually were answered as the presentations went on. Um, so I think maybe if, if you have any burning questions that haven't yet been addressed, if you don't mind just typing them in again for me, um, that'll just make it a little bit easier to move forward. Okay, so a question coming in from Deborah Curran, who's um, with the, the law faculty here at the University of Victoria. Um, thanks very much to both of you. She says she is interested in the timing issue. While we don't have nearly the resources that California does to put into planning, uh, we have less of a problem, so can be more strategic in where we plan. Um, how do the groundwater adjudications in California interact with the groundwater sustainability planning? And uh, Thomas, I just want to confirm if you're actually on the line because I cannot hear you. I'm on the line and I've switched my my I've switched out of my headset and I'm using the phone directly. So I hope this is better. Okay, perfect. Thank and you again, so much. My apologies. Thomas. My apologies for the for the bad line. Um, some, somehow that changed since we tested this out uh, the other day. Yeah. Anyway. So this question, um, Randy can answer this as well, or correct me if I'm wrong. In principle, the adjudicated basins are actually exempt from the Groundwater Sustainability Act because they're presumed to be already um, in sustainability, in, in a sustainable mode. Um, and the law explicitly wanted to stay away from getting into the way of court decisions that have already been made and took decades to get to. Yeah, that, that's my reading of uh, the regime is that where there's been an adjudication that the, the requirements under the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act don't apply. Okay, the next question coming from, question coming from Jenny Frazier asking, how is sustainability measured under the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act? My reading of that, this is, is Thomas, there is no prescribed, at this point, there's no prescribed measurement. The slide that you see in front of you, the last slide that Randy showed, that is 
the definition of sustainability. It's actually sustainability is defined as not having no um, undesirable results, and these undesirable results are defined as the list that you see there. Um, beyond that, the Department of Water Resources is um, in charge of defining minimum guidelines, uh, which would have to address somehow what this thing, sustainability measure actually is. And it remains to be seen how general or prescriptive the department wants to go about it. The department is in a, it has, has until the end of next year to come up with these guidelines as to what basically what's, what, what is a, an acceptable groundwater sustainability plan, which at the core is how do you measure, you know, how do you define a minimum amount, or how do you define whether you are in sustainable, sustainable mode or not? The department's strategic approach was just published a couple of weeks ago, and essentially what they're doing is they are going out on listening sessions. Um, they will have public listening sessions. They're going in with stakeholders to have a technical advisory uh, panel. They will look listen to various interests and professional groups over the next few months. First, on the definition of groundwater groundwater basins and how to define procedures for changing the boundaries of groundwater basins, especially in the Central Valley where you have many sub-basins that are adjacent to each other and exchange significant amounts of groundwater. And then secondly, on, on the sustainability plans, um, but they will ultimately make the decision internal um, without a really a whole lot of um, um, recourse by the public uh, to change or um, challenge those regulations when they come out. Randy, and correct me if your perspective, um, if my perspective here is wrong. No, that, that, that's my understanding. I would just say that as, uh, as uh, Thomas pointed out, um, I've, I've scrolled back to the slide that, that are the, the criteria that are going to be in place in California. And, and I would just only add just to to reiterate for the BC context, um, you know, BC is going to BC needs to develop the list uh, that would be you know most appropriate uh, for for it. So I mean, I, it might in some ways overlap with that list, but um, I would I would uh, expect or hope that in BC there would be a more explicit criteria that look at um, environmental flows. Um, and perhaps uh, other criteria that might look at ensuring uh, a specific priority for, say, domestic water uses um, in times of, of scarcity. Okay. I'm going to just jump around a little bit, um, Deb Curran, picking up on her initial question, uh, just to follow up asking, would you say that uh, adjudications are more expensive than planning? And is she right in assuming that adjudications are not uh, mandated dispute resolution? Or that adjudications do not mandate dispute resolution, sorry. Randy, you want to go for this? Um, yeah, and then, and then you can jump in if, yeah. um, if, uh, if I've overlooked anything. Uh, in terms of um, the adjudication, I, I think it's important to, to recognize at the outset that it's, it's, it's a very uh, confrontational legal process, so it's generally triggered um, in, in many cases by a, a specific water user, uh, quite often a senior water user, feeling that their, their rights are being impacted and, and requesting the court's assistance. And there's going to be um, clear winners and losers uh, coming out of an adjudication, and you're not going to have the flexibility um, that you might get in a planning process. Um, and the other thing I would, I would say, uh, to, to get back to the question of whether it's going to be more expensive, um, you know, there's not the track record yet under the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, but whenever you're running, um, resolving disputes through the court, it's, it's very expensive. So my expectation would be that it's um, probably going to be uh, cheaper to go uh, develop these plans under the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And to add to that, there is currently an effort underway by 
the administration to actually um, amend legis add legislation this year that would streamline the adjudication process. And my understanding uh, from the discussions that I've had is that the, um, the main intent of the legislation would be to essentially get the adjudication process to a point where it would essentially defer to the sustainability planning process. Okay, the next question comes from June Ross, um, and she's asking if watershed boards have any clout in legislation. Um, I'm not sure if she's referring to the, the California or to the, the BC Water Sustainability Act. I'm, I'm sorry, Lord, I was actually looking at a comment in the box. Could you just repeat that? Sorry about that. Yeah, absolutely. So the question is from June Ross asking if watershed boards have any clout in legislation. Um, I'm not sure if she's referring to the California uh, Groundwater Act or to the, to the BC Water Sustainability Act. So we don't have watershed boards. I'm unclear on, on that process. In terms of the cloud on the legislation, the um, governor in, the 19, in, in late 2013, at the end of a second year of drought, um, set out a, a strategic plan on water for California. And as part of that, invited comments on how California should be managing its groundwater, which was by the larger water agencies taken as a clear clue that he was going to go down the road of potentially implementing some kind of groundwater uh, reform for the state. And as a result, um, the Association of California Water Agencies, which is representing essentially all of the uh, water agencies, both agricultural irrigation districts and urban water districts and water purveyors, um, went on an internal process of developing a straw man or a straw man outline or an outline of the fundamental basis that such legislation would have to be based on. There were some other efforts by other groups that came out in the spring with proposals on, on the basis for such legislation, which then essentially became the foundation of the legislation as it evolved over the spring and summer. And uh, I'll just jump in and, and say a few words about BC to the extent that there, in BC there are some um, local uh, watershed uh, uh, organizations. There's, there's groups like the Fraser Basin Council. Uh, there's some other groups in BC. Uh, to some extent they have a statutory mandate. Um, they don't have um, the kind of decision-making authority that, that um, in, in lead role that's going to be contemplated under the California Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. So um, before I move on to the other questions, I'm actually just going to open a poll here um, that, that you can give us some input on. We, as I said at the beginning, given the sort of minds in the virtual space here, we do like to use this as a bit of a um, research outlet to get some preliminary results and um, this question that June asked actually ties in with a with this question that I had created earlier um, so if anybody wants to fill that out that would be appreciated um, a couple questions I'm going to actually partner up um, one from June asking when and how was uh, California groundwater mapped um, and a question also from Hans Schreier asking, um, what is the age of the groundwater in California and how quickly are the aquifers recharged? So the age of it, how quickly they're recharged, and when was the mapping done? So the, the mapping, let me, let me kind of take that question a little bit broader and, and, and answer the question, how do, how do we know, how long have we known anything about groundwater in, in California? When were most of the studies done? The state actually spent significant resources in the first half of the 20th century to do reconnaissance, uh, not only on its geology, but also on its uh, groundwater resources. Um, most of the reports that we still reference today, when we look at characterization of groundwater basins, have been written in the 20s, 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, and all the way through the 1960s. Um, um, by the Department of Water Resources and by the U.S. Geological Survey. And that is the 
period, and that is really the work that the Department of Water Resources has used when, and I'm not familiar exactly with the date, uh, but essentially the groundwater basin map that, is, that you have seen in my slides, and that is on the websites uh, that you will find under the uh, Department of Water Resources. Those maps come out of what's called Bulletin 118, which is essentially the department's groundwater planning document, and which has not really been updated over the last 10 years. There's now an update process underway. But these maps were first, these boundaries were first defined in Bulletin 118, and I suspect they go back to the 1950s or 1960s. Um, when the, the geology wasn't that, much, that different, not any different from what it is today, but when certainly the politics were very different from today. Um, and many of these groundwater basin boundaries are not defined based on the physics of groundwater flow, but based on political boundaries and watershed boundaries. And then with respect to the age of groundwater, so that goes back to this bathtub concept and this bathtub that's filled with sediment. We have, in the Central Valley, we have um, thousands of meters of uh, sediment. Consider approximately, and this is very roughly speaking, the upper 600 to 1,000 meter of these sediments typically contain fresh water. Once you get lower than that, you get into a brackish and saline water. Um, the age, in, uh, the age is essentially a function of depth, um, and very, very roughly speaking, you know, you can say if the, you know, for every meter you go down, you're probably adding an, a year or a few years in age, and that's just a matter of the travel time. Um, so at depth, we're looking at century to millennia old groundwater. Um, in most of California, unless you're in a small basin up north with a lot of rain. Um, your, the age of water that discharges into streams will be, um, you know, decades. Um, with some of the water being very young, the water that, that recharges next to the stream and then just flows into the stream is very young, and uh, the rest of it is older. What we pump out of domestic wells tends to be on the order of a few years to decades, and what we pump out of our deeper irrigation and uh, large urban wells tends to be relatively old that is decades to centuries old. OK, so we have only about three minutes on the clock. And I have about six questions in the docket here. Um, I'll, I'll keep going through them chronologically. Um, I don't know, um, Randy and Thomas, if you're willing to stay for an extra maybe 10 minutes. I don't know if the, the participants in the room can even stick around. Um, so maybe when we hit 10.30, we can sort of see if there's a critical exodus or, or if it's worth continuing to go, assuming that you have the time to do that. I do. Yeah, Pardon I can me. stick around if, if there are people are still on the webinar. Okay, perfect. Um, so the next question from Julie Pisani, um, saying that significant and unreasonable impacts on groundwater have yet to be defined. Will there be provincial guidance on this, or is there solely a local task to define what is significant and unreasonable impact on a local scale? Yeah, uh, just to clarify, and it, it may, some of the comments may have come after that question was, was typed, but um, those criteria are specifically for California. There's not you know, similar criteria under, uh, under the Water Sustainability Act right now. So, uh, I, the, the point I would try to make is, is that we, we need to be developing uh, the appropriate criteria for BC and the appropriate standards. So the next question from Gwen Graham, um, are California Senate Bills 221 and 610 in effect, i.e. requirement for local land use authorities to demonstrate long-term water supply availability before approving new large development projects? So to my knowledge, if I get this right, these, these laws, in fact, are, are in effect, um, but they are limited to urban development. They don't say anything about agricultural development. And one of the biggest challenges that we have seen in the last five to 10 years is with the um, more widespread use of sprinkler, micro-sprinkler and drip irrigation, 
farming has been able to reach into um, areas in, at the margins of the valleys, especially at the margin of the Central Valley, that have never been farmed before, where we had dryland farming. Um, and they've been able to put thousands of acres of new farmland into, into production with groundwater resources that they tap into and that nobody does any assessments on. OK, the next question from Richard Bose. In BC, local governments are required to adopt integrated stormwater management plans under the Liquid Waste Management Act for watershed health. Was there any discussion around changing or linking the two BC acts so that groundwater management is actually a requirement in each ISMP, Integrated Stormwater Management Plan? I, I can't say for sure, but I'm not. Um aware that that was considered. It wasn't, it wasn't considered in the discussion, the official discussion papers for the Water Sustainability Act. Next question from Susie Porterbop asking, is there any, any opportunity to not apply first in time, first in right to groundwater under, the, under BC's Water Sustainability Act? I, I would say, uh, there's the opportunity, and um, I can't remember the name of the paper, but Deb Curran wrote um, a, a quite a good paper, uh, part of the UVic Environmental Law Center, that, that dealt with uh, whether or not compensation was payable in in the uh, in the event that in the events that water rights were modified, and the answer was that they compensation wasn't pay, pay, uh, payable, and that's actually, that principle has worked its way into uh, the Water Sustainability Act in general. So could, could you modify the water rights? Yeah, uh, in the theory you can. My, my understanding is that's not uh, on the table um, and that, that the groundwater, we, don't, we haven't seen the groundwater regs yet, but my understanding is they will be developed to, um, to recognize uh, uses on a priority basis, on it, uh, so on, based on the historical uh, start date of the use. Okay. Um, I know that, Deb Curran, I know you're um, on the line today. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head which paper Randy's referring to. If you happen to know and, and are able to provide the link in the chat box, that would be helpful. Um, if not, not a, not a big deal. Um, so we're at 1032. Um, I, I see there's more questions pouring in. Um, I think I'm going to try to just get through those ones that had come in before our deadline, so I've got two more. Um, one from Rick Simpson saying, does First Nations water rights factor into the California experience? Um, and he's confused how First Nations water rights have been factored into the BC Water Sustainability Act implementation process. The, on the California side, the, the First Nations water rights fall under federal water rights and are superior to anything that the state that the state does. But the legislation encourages communication um, with with an, an encouragement with First Nations, um, but it doesn't. It, there's no jurisdiction by the state over First Nations water rights. As yeah, and. Uh, on, on the BC side, I think that's a, a, a good observation that uh, it's not clear under the, the Water Sustainability Act how um, First Nations rights are going to be recognized and, and accommodated. And I, there, there is, as I understand it, an ongoing uh, series of discussions with, with First Nations and uh, groups representative of, of, of many First Nations. Uh, I'm not, I'm not privy to what's what's being discussed in those those meetings though. But it's not if you look at the act as it's written, it's not clear how First Nations rights are going to be respected. And it and I, I should just say for, for people who, who may not be um, that well versed in, in B C water law, it's not even uh, the the true nature and extent of First Nations uh, water rights or rights that support other First Nations rights, such as hunting or fishing, that's not yet uh, clearly defined in law either. So coming back to the, the note that Randy had mentioned from the, the UVic Environmental Law Center here, 
Um, I don't I don't have the the exact submission to the government, but I've just um, linked to a blog post that Deb Curran had written. So for those of you who are interested, you can follow that link there. Um, so it's 10.35. Um, I can see we still have about 50 people in the room. Um, I'm assuming if you're still in the room that you're willing to hang out for a little while longer. Um, so I may sort of say I'll do three more um, questions um, chronologically, the first of which is from Cheryl Gilpin saying, do the agency boards use water use fees to lobby the legislature? Randy, I'm going to have to punt this to you. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I fully understand uh, the question, I, uh, and I wasn't part. I haven't been following the discussion, so I don't know what what led to it. But in uh, British Columbia, the water rental fees that are that currently exist for surface water rights are are paid um, to the provincial government. Um, some of the water use boards have their own sources of funding, but from my understanding, that's not that's not specifically from the water um, rental fees. And uh, I just note that, as many of you are probably aware, um, there, the Water Sustainability Act proposes uh, expanding the um, water rental fee system to groundwater use as well as part of bringing groundwater use into the licensing system. And there was a, a recent proposal that uh, was released publicly um, that did uh, increase uh, water rental fees somewhat, although um, many people feel that it, it would be merited to increase them even more. Okay, question from Matthew Burke. Do basins of surface water and groundwater significant, significantly overlap or differ in most cases? I, this is Thomas. I mean, just, um, Add to Randy's on the previous questions first. Oh yeah, sure. Quickly. Sorry, Thomas. Um, the so I'm I do not know the legalese of who, 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 what what water districts or irrigation districts or water purveyors can use to pay lobbyists um, to work with uh, with the state legislature, but they certainly do um, wherever that money comes from. Um, Water districts frequently have people working in the capital. Aqua, the Association of California, California Water Agencies, is very active in the capital, capital. And I don't think you can pass any legislation um, if you can't get Aqua to be behind it, especially not legislation that's, that's as big as the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act was. And then on the uh, question of overlying, you know, groundwater basins and watersheds, there, are in, in general, the groundwater basins are um, underlying the watersheds. Um, they are at the, the boundaries differ, especially in the mountainous regions. The boundaries may differ uh, significantly. Once you get into the into the basins um, themselves, basically the the, the bathtub fills, um, the um, the watersheds are very broad, and the watershed boundaries are not really groundwater boundaries. Um, the, um, the groundwater moves freely uh, between, between watershed boundaries on the valley floors and is driven by subsurface gradients um, that are in turn driven by groundwater pumping much more so than by the boundaries of, of the surface watersheds. Great, thanks. Okay, last question from Gwyn Graham. Is water getting more expensive in California? Yes. The Easy question. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> last year, it's not only getting more expensive, but people are willing to pay more money. Agriculture has typically uses water that costs 10 to $30 an acre foot, acre foot being about 1.2 million liters. Um, the not, in some areas that have imported water supplies, water may cost the farmer on the order of 100 to 300 dollars an acre foot. Last year, there was there were a couple offers made by uh, farmers that grow almond orchards, permanent crops that they wanted to save 
where um, as much as $2,000 was offered for an acre foot of water. Not on a large scale, but these offers were made. All right. I want to um, give a big thank you to both Randy and Thomas for their time and presentations and expertise today. Um, and also to those of you remaining in the room, there's still about 40 of you hanging on. Um, so I want to thank you. Um, this was quite a, quite a detailed discussion, a lot of questions, and a lot of, um, a lot of passion, I guess, from the group. Um, so I want to thank you for that. Um, as we said earlier, there is this forthcoming briefing note. Um, also, I did record the session today, so we'll try to release those two things at the same time um, within the next few weeks. So everybody on the call, you'll get a notification from us when those things are available. Um, and as always, stay tuned for details on the next webinar. We have uh, two more coming up in this year's series. Um, and if you want to see the recordings of all of our past sessions, you can head to our YouTube channel. Uh, Randy and Thomas, any final words? Thank you for having me. Good discussion. Great comments. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Laura, for all your work putting this together. It's great to to try and bring attention to to the Water Sustainability Act uh, process because we need public involvement and pressure to uh, make sure that we get you know the kind of regulation that we need. Great. Thank you both, and um, yeah, everybody on the line, have a wonderful day today, and um, hopefully we'll see you next time around. Bye. Bye.